Hello, fellow coders. We're here with another brand new edition of an algorithm and data structure video in my aptly titled Conquering the JavaScript Interview Playlist Series Whatevs. We're back to doing some algorithms after doing some data structure stuff in the previous videos, and I'm going to tackle a bunch of other uh, array algorithms that you might encounter in your uh, interviews. You never know, right? So arrays, objects, and uh, dates. If you're really good at manipulating those in interview questions, you will be a rock star coder in no time. So let's go ahead and tackle this one as a good entry level for beginners to kind of wrap their head around. I'm calling it array duplicates. The purpose of this particular algorithm is to write a function named remove duplicate that takes an array argument R and returns an array with all duplicate values removed. For example, if we call remove duplicates with this array input of one, two, three, two, one, four, five, four, we see that there are several repeated elements inside of this array. It should instead return an array of one, two, three, four, five, meaning that the additional twos, ones, and fours have all been removed, right? That's a fairly straightforward uh, task, and we're going to break it down into a couple of different approaches. Some, I would say, borderline mean tier approaches and how to solve this particular one. Uh, the important thing to remember here is this is actually like a fun little analogy and like thought experiment that we do. Um, you know, as anyone that's come through this video that already has some previous experience, maybe you're looking to just encounter new ways of approaching problems and solutions. Y'all been very awesome in the comments about showing about, you know, sharing your uh, alternate or more efficient solutions, which I'll comment on that a little bit down the line. Um, but again, like I do this a lot for super newbies or people that have just finished our full stack curriculum that, you know, know how to build CRUD apps, but still have, may not have like the experience you might get in comp sci or computer science courses at a university where you will tackle more low level algorithms and common things like that versus the practicality of well, building apps straight up. Um, so this is one of those questions that I kind of, we would kind of do during uh, student interviews when they want to join our full stack boot camp. We would ask them how they would think or describe to us how to like remember the highest card or how they might tackle an algorithm like this. Because we can imagine we have a box of different color marbles and we want to remove any duplicates so they only have one of each color. So I might ask like my prospective student, describe to me the process that you would do to isolate a collection of marbles without any duplicate colors. I mean, this kind of thought experiment is exactly what us programmers have to do. We have to tell the computer these individual steps to solve a problem like this, right? But, you know, again, people that don't program that go through these thought experiments are like, well, you know, I would just pick out the ones that are unique colors, but you're like, okay, how? Because a computer can't just infer that kind of, uh, I think it's like a declarative solution. You have to have an imperative solution for the computer to run, meaning I have to write out every single step for it to actually do that, right? So basically, uh, as coders, we know we would write a for loop because clearly we're going to have to loop through some level of elements in an array, or in our case, we're going to pick up every single marble out of the box. And for each marble that we pick up, we're going to check to see if we've already seen a marble of that color. And then we're going to keep the track of the colors we've already seen. We're going to have like a separate empty box that we're going to go, hey, this is the first time I've seen a blue one. I'm going to put it in here. Oh, blue? There's already a blue in there, so I can skip that one. Green? That's the first time I've seen it, right? So for each marble in the original box, the jumbled colored box of marbles, you would look into the empty box and see if you've already seen a marble of that color. If you haven't seen it before, you would add that to the empty box. If you have seen it before, you would go to the next, you would toss it aside and go to the next marble. And at the end, you'll end up with that empty box of unique, uh, single marbles of each color. And then you'd have all the rest duplicates sent away or move somewhere else and remove basically, right? And that's exactly what we're gonna be doing here in today's solution in a couple of different ways. So with that thought experiment in mind, let's actually start coding some uh, possible solutions. And again, like there are multiple ways you can solve this, some that are very short, some that are very verbose, some that are less efficient or less optimized, but nevertheless, let's go ahead and tackle one of the ways you might think, right? So. Let's say that we are going to go through with an 
Yeah, okay, let's just go ahead and start coding some stuff here. So obviously for visualization purposes, I need to make sure that I'm gonna be console logging some values and for testing purposes, we need to return a value from this function so it can be tested if this was something we were turning in, for example. So I know that ultimately I will need to have some kind of uh, return array or something like that, or we can call it like the out array, the array we're going to spit out after this is done. This is going to be the array we're going to return when we have finished looping through our input array and have removed all duplicates. So we're gonna go ahead and write out our return statement. And I'm also going to console log my array here so I can uh, visualize it with y'all when actually trying to code this out. And I'll go ahead and just call remove duplicates as well. Remove duplicates. I'm gonna pass it that input array right here so we can uh, test to make sure it works the way it does. It won't have to be a whole lot of different kinds of uh, test inputs because if it removes duplicates from this array, we can probably assume it'll safely remove them from all arrays. So there you go. Uh, that's where we're gonna start. Now, the path we're going to choose is like I said, we need to have some kind of you know, way of checking, have we seen this element before? And we can do that by associating with have we seen this element before with a maybe key and value pair, AKA our good friend, the JavaScript object. It's a great way of storing key value pairs. So I can say, we can have an object that, can, that will consist of key keys of the colors of marbles we've seen with a Boolean value of true for that key or property in the object. This is how we're gonna say, hey, we've seen red marbles before, which means we're gonna go ahead and not put the red marble in our empty box here, right? That's the, the logic we're gonna go down. So this is the this is the way I would say is like kind of like the most logical way to achieve this. And we're gonna be utilizing a particular aspect of JavaScript arrays. Let's go ahead and do one of these, const test equals curly braces. And let's say I'm looking for red marbles, right? So uh, we can do the dot notation. We're gonna use the square bracket notation of properties instead, because again, we need this to be dynamically keyed in our for loop here, so I'll say, have we seen red marbles before? This is a pure example here. This is like a collection of marble colors. We're gonna go ahead and run this code here by saving it. And, oh, the const, yeah, we're, we called out array, hence why we get the empty array brackets. It's like, where'd that come from? But yeah, we're gonna be utilizing this little feature of JavaScript objects in that if the key value or property you're looking for does not exist inside of an object, it will give you a not an error, but undefined. And in JavaScript, undefined is considered a falsy value when evaluating in a condition or a short circuit or something like that. So we can use this logic of undefined being falsy to determine whether we've seen something or not. Meaning, if we had seen red marbles before, it will return a Boolean, straight Boolean value of true, not truthy or falsy, but a straight true value. And we could use this undefined uh, against true logic to determine whether we've seen something before and should we put it into our returning array or not. So that's what we're gonna be leveraging here in this particular solution. Okay, like I said, we're gonna have to ultimately at some point in time loop through our array, classic for loop stuff, nothing to it. Now, we need to, I mean, I can, Put this into a variable. I could do some shorthanding here. Let's just write it longhand to see how this ends up turning out, and then we'll swap some code around for a more legible solution. Because again, ultimately, you know, there needs to be a, a, a line between what I'm showing my newbies out there in terms of readability compared to some of the cool shorthand, more optimized solutions that y'all typically throw in the comments, which I love reading, by the way. I like I like seeing, you know, edge cases accounted for and other things like that. But again, back to focus in Luke. Let's go, guy. So we have our loop coming through here and we can either store the elements into a variable or again, we can always just reference the element via the code R square bracket I since that's each element of our input array we are looping through. What we need to do is to say if, 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 if we in our exists object do not see this element in my object, that will get us undefined, meaning we have not seen this color of marble 
before. That's undefined, and undefined is falsy, which means this will be ignored. So I can do the opposite of falsy to get truthy, to say, hey, if it does not exist in my array or my object, what I need to do is two things. Push the element into my output array, like so. No, it's not push square brackets, Luke. What are you doing? <laughs> push is a method. There we go. I got a little happy. I got too happy with square brackets. There we go. Uh, push the element into my output array because it's the first time I've seen it. And I also have to add it to my object. So on future uh, encounterings of the color red, we know we have seen that color, which means we ignore it and not push it into my array because then it'll be a true value, and the opposite of true will be false, which makes the if statement not fire off. Then, after all that is done, the loop is done going through our input array, we should theoretically be left with a output array that has our uh, only our singular values without duplicates, and guess what? It is as easy as that, folks, using this object method. There we go, that's the console log we were looking for. One, two, three, four, five, the combination to my logic luggage, get in the comments if you know that reference. Um, that's the solution we're looking for. And that's one of many different ways to do so, right? So the idea is we start looping and we keep an object and associated array. If we find an element for the first time, we set its value as true in the object. That tells us we've added it at least once already to our output array. And if you find the element already exists in the object, then we don't return it, then we don't push it into the array because we've already seen it before. And it is as simple as that to get it solved here. So like I said, we're gonna go through a couple different potential solutions here. I mean, you could also argue that, you know, for efficiency or optimization, you could always do the following by declaring multiple variables in one line. I, you know, I will sometimes do that if I'm looking for performance or something like that, but it really is, it's kind of like a pro con thing where, you know, Initializing and declaring multiple variables in one line with comma separated spaces is good for performance for sure. Like if you're dealing with tons of variables or tons of data, large numbers of variables, uh, declaring them in this fashion is a more efficient solution when it comes to performance. It uh, can also be a lot more concise uh, rather than declaring multiple variables across multiple lines. Uh, cons would be things like readability, like declaring too many variables in one set of commas can get kind of confusing to read if you're not used to that style, right? And you can also have issues with the uh, scope if you're not careful, right? So if you declare all the variables with commas, they're all in the same scope, and that can act, you know, that could lead to issues uh, by reusing variable name, or if you need access to a variable from a different scope, that can be difficult to manage if you're declaring them all in one line with commas, right? So the opposite basically is true of doing it what I just had here. This is some like you know comments from my more advanced users or wondering why I tend to do it this way, uh, readability-wise versus declaring multiples in one go via comma separated uh, variable names. Again. I prefer the readability of these individual declarations lines myself, right? That's really good for beginners to understand and clearly see where my head is going, right? Other bits of clear, uh, clearness, we could also do something like this, the Ella. We could use a variable called Ella for our code clarity right there so we can see, right, a bit nice what it looks like. And then from there, we could always do the same thing where I say const Ella of array and that lets us get away with some even more shorthand which you know in previous videos I've always said is a good thing to do when it comes to readability or if you're on a whiteboard this is leaves room much less room for error than writing out the long form would be so there's some comments I want to throw here from my, my more advanced uh, video watchers because again like a lot of the times I do this from my uh my students that know nothing about coding so that's why I have ten very verbose or I don't account for certain things like not bothering if the array is like one element long. So if the array length is one or zero, then there's no point in doing any of this code whatsoever. So we can return early. I've seen comments like that and in, in, under these YouTube videos, great stuff. Keep throwing in there. If I see something I like, I'll try and pin it to the top of the video as alternate or more advanced solutions for my more advanced students out there. Okay. So like I said, this is one of many different ways we could do so, and there's actually another interesting way I want y'all to consider and maybe add something new into your tool belt, right? Like I mentioned in the description of this video and in my first couple of videos in this playlist series as I was figuring out how I wanted to make this free online course, um, you know, alternate solutions are good, and I like, like thinking about this as not just giving you like a 
you know, a built up house. I'd rather give you the plans to build a house and I want to help you equip your tool belt with as many tools you can competently use as possible. So this next solution is in the vein of that. I want y'all to have this tool in your tool belt to take into consideration to use. So there is nothing wrong with this solution. The object is completely fine and probably going to be more performative uh, and like more efficient in performance than what I'm about to switch it to. So watch this. Uh, we can call it out array. We can call it result. It doesn't really matter. Uh, just so we can see how sim how similar it's going to look. We're going to leave. We're going to change this name to map instead of exists as a singular object. We're going to uh, create a new map constructor. We're going to instantiate new map class here, and a map is just like a JavaScript object with a couple of key differences, right? Obviously. Uh, the map object will keep track of unique elements, right? So we're gonna loop through that uh, input array just like we've done before, and we're gonna simply check to see if the key value pair exists inside of maps. If it doesn't exist, we add to the map using the set method, and then maps have a method called has that allows us to see if a value, key value pair already exists inside our maps and they have to be unique, which is pretty cool, right? So to do that bit of code here, what we need to do is change up a couple of things, right? So instead of uh, exists Ella true, we're going to say map dot set. Okay, so set is our new method here. Set the element with a value of true, I think is the syntax I'm looking for, right? So we're going to take our map and we're going to set a new key value pair where we have the element as the key, the color of the marble and the Boolean value of true. And it's going to work in a similar capacity, right? Where we push that element into the outer array because it means we are good to go. And instead of saying, Hey, does that property exist using this logic right here? We're going to say if the map has the element we're looping through. If it has that element with a value of true, that means we've seen it before and we skip that colored marble. So if we save the code, we get the same output, which is what I'm looking for. So again, why am I showing y'all this different way of doing it? Again, just adding a tool to your tool belt. Now you know a l at least two methods, has and set, that you can use inside of maps. You might be wondering, Luke, what is the point of doing that if there really isn't much of a difference between the code solution for maps or objects, right? So I mean, here, here's some things to keep in mind. Uh, why would I want to use the map object, right? It allows us to store keys of any type while objects can only use strings as keys. So if we have, if we were looping through an array that doesn't have simple numbers or strings as its elements, we could do something cool with these map objects in that regard. Uh, they had that built-in has method that I was talking about that lets you check if a key exists in a map. While regular objects, you have to use has own property method or search the object's keys to see if it exists, right? So if we had to do something a bit more complex by looping through an object, we would have to do something a bit more complex, whereas map has the has method built into it for us here. Uh, and the other nice thing about maps is they uh, maintain the order of their keys, while regular objects do not guarantee any specific order. I know probably all of y'all have had like large objects that you write in a certain way, but when you console log it, the keys or properties are reordered into like alpha A through Z alphabetized order, right? And you're like, I didn't write it that way. Well, it's because that's, it's not guaranteed. The order is not important for JavaScript objects. Whereas the map, it does maintain the order of the keys. So potentially looping through them might be quicker if you have to uh, do so, if you know their order, right? But there are, it's not just all sunshine, uh, sunshine and rainbows and sprinkles here where, you know, there are some cons. Uh, you don't really see, maps are way less used than just JavaScript objects. So code may be less familiar to other developers, right? So that's one of the cons of using the map object. And you also have to be, they can be slower than regular objects in certain contexts, since iterating over a map requires more overhead than iterating over the keys of a regular object, right? Right, so the performance between using a map and a regular object in this case is doesn't matter, it's negligible. However, if you need to store complex keys or need to maintain the order of a keys, map might be the better choice. So like I said, keep that in mind. It's a good tool to have in your tool belt when knowing about, hey, I need something a bit more a bit more specific than just a JavaScript object for my particular solution here. So yeah, I thought that was a, a cool way to do it and I wanted to show you all that. We actually have a couple more solutions. Uh, I have one that's incredibly unperformative because I don't like nesting for loops if you don't have to for these kinds of solutions is that really ruins your big O notation performance, right? 
Uh, well, how about we can do a cheesy solution here? Yeah, let's do a cheesy. Let's do a fun cheesy solution here, right? So this one, this one uses a, a, once again very very similar logic here that we've been doing, uh, and it doesn't have to make use of any kind of have we seen this before? We're going to be utilizing a very clever uh, trick here to accomplish a similar thing. Uh, the ultimate goal is to once again have some kind of logic that says, hey, uh, if we have seen this element before or we haven't seen this element before, push it into our output array. Otherwise, don't push it into our output array. So how are we going to achieve that? Well, we're going to be using our own output array that we are currently building as the base, okay? Uh, arrays in JavaScript, and, or ES6 and later, ES5 and later, I don't know when it was, who cares? They had this method called index of, and it returns the index of the first occurrence of a value in an array, or negative one if it is not present. And we're gonna leverage this negative one here for ourselves. So we're gonna say, try and find the index of the element in our input array we are currently looping through. Remember, that's what LS stands for. It is the element of our input array that we're looking at right now. If the element of our input array in our output array has a negative one value, that means it does not exist in that array, which means we push it into our output array. If it does exist, it'll be its index value, which will not be a negative one, which means it exists, which means it does not push it to our output array. And guess what? Another way, and that's why I call it a bit more of a cheesy solution because again, this just leverages a trick you might know about arrays. And again, like, you know, I've seen some comments going, you wouldn't write this in an interview, but I'm like, I would have, depending on my interviewer, I would, as the interviewee, I would definitely try and give them a laugh, uh, find a way to talk about something kind of fun and cool, show them I know my array methods, show them I could solve it without using array methods like my previous map and objects exist solutions. This just kind of streamlines it down to showing that, you know, I know a cool trick of arrays that gets this going here. So yeah, uh, another possible solution that could lead to fun discussion and show that you can even begin tackling uh, problems in different kinds of ways. Like this is, I mean, this might be less readable than the object and map solutions because that's very obvious. You're checking against, have you seen this before? Where this simply is constantly looping through our output array looking for these uh, next, to see if the element exists or not. So yeah, uh, that's what this solution does. And this ensures that we only get a list of unique results. Now, you know, I think... I don't know why I had this one written down here because this is really, really not my favorite, but let us assume the following. Because again, like what we're going to do here is we're going to try and take this because like I said, it is a, it's, it's going to be a loop, right? It is, it has to loop through our output array looking to see if that element exists or not. So what if we weren't allowed these array methods, but we didn't immediately think of that object exists solution that I had just a few minutes ago. Well, the other way we could think about this is unfortunately using a double for loop, right? What I can say is we can loop through now our output array for every single time. This is essentially what index, that index of solution was doing, just written out in long form. That's what we're kind of, we're, we're breaking it into the long form solution. So nesting for loops is, ne is gonna have like an exponential performance. I think it's like a big O of N squared. Uh, because again, like for every outer loop, we have to have an inner loop going longer and longer and longer. So it's an exponential curve in terms of performance to time and things like that. So. What we can do is we can say const, or oh, we have to make up the better names for these, because this will be input Ella for the input array, output Ella of our result array or our out array. I like how I called one R and one array when I tell you all try and be consistent. So let's go and switch that down to R to be as consistent as possible here. All right, so that's what we have to do. And we're gonna have to set a variable for each element we're looping through to say let found equal false, a Boolean value. This kind of corresponds to the negative one that we would see outputted from the index of array method. And we're gonna say, if our input element that we are coming across is 
the same as one of the output elements we are looping through, then we're going to say found equals true, and we're going to break the loops from running because we've it's been found, which means we do not have to uh, continue going through our output array anymore, right? Because again, it's a double for loop. This one goes to each element of our input and compares each element of our input to every element of our output every single time, which again, this is why I said it's not exactly a performative solution, right? It's not very good, but it does get the job done. And then all we need to do is write an if statement that says if an element that we've been looping through has not been found, then we're going to take our output array, output R now, and push in our input Ella, because that's what we're, we're comparing to see each input element to our output array to see if it already exists there. This is basically what the index of solution did behind the scenes with more code, right? So hopefully it's clear how we got here. Like I said, I do not like this solution that much, but it does get the job done with any luck. I need to call these out R and call them out R, there we go. Yeah, so we got the desired solution, which is one, two, three, four, and five. Righto, uh, two nested for loops, kind of hard to manage uh, if you're in a whiteboard style interview, if, you're, if you get to use a code editor. Uh, like VS Code during an interview, then you know, kudos to you that you could have the autocomplete and things like that happening here. It basically just compares each element of the input array with every element of our output array and just makes sure that uh, the element from the input doesn't already exist in the output array. And that's what this combo does here. And like I said, not my favorite, but it does get the job done. Okay, so I'm gonna round this video out with the memeiest of meme solutions. Uh, again, Read the room. If your interviewer doesn't seem like they would laugh at a joke, <laughs> then I would not advise writing this. But if you feel like you have a good rapport with your interviewer, getting a laugh is always really good, right? Even if it's self-deprecating or if you just wrote a very joke-style answer. But nevertheless, this does technically solve this algorithm with one line of singular code. And you might be wondering, what? What are you talking about there, homie? Oh, I didn't console log anything. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so if if I was your interviewer and you wrote this, I would cackle madly. And we'd probably have, we'd exchange some fun words. We would talk about maybe the set object. I might quiz you to see if you just memorized this or saw it from my video. <laughs> or, um, you know, I'd ask you some questions about the set object to see, again, are you just memeing me here or do you actually know how this works under the hood? Then as the interviewee, I would definitely go, all right, jo jokes aside, let me let me actually write out some, you know, I'll write out that exists object logic to get the job done. And so you might be wondering what the heck happened here and why is it working? This implements the set object in JavaScript. Ooh, another one. I'm, I'm showing you all lots of extra stuff here, aren't I? This is a super bonus video. Uh, it The set removes duplicates from the input array by being an object that lets you store unique values of any type. And using the spread operator along with the set constructor lets us convert the unique values from the set data type back into an array data type to fulfill our goal here. The set object is a built-in object in JavaScript that allows you to store unique values of any type, whether primitive values or object references. A set is similar to an array in that it is an ordered collection of values, but unlike an array, a set does not allow duplicate values. So basically it will take every unique value it comes across, add it to the set, remove all duplicates, and then with the spread operator and square brackets on the return statement, we simply convert it back into an array. So it's array-like, but doesn't allow duplicates, and we heavily leverage this fundamental knowledge to get this done with a single line of meme uh, code, I would say. And again, like if you could, if you could get it, if you feel like you could write this and have a laugh about it and discuss sets a little bit further how this works, and then writing out the uh, one of the other solutions I gave you in this video, that's that's interviewing masterclass right there, right? Other things to keep in mind: sets use and add, delete, has, and size. Well, add, delete, has methods, kind of like our map. It has that same has method. Uh, again, because they're unique, you can see if an element is uh, exists in a set easily. Uh, instead of a length, they have a size property. Uh, you can iterate over the values of a set using the for each method or a for of loop. So while you can't 
so you can keep the you can still use some cool shorthands with sets that you can with like arrays like we have uh, here in our code where in previous solutions I use the const for of loop solutions uh, and you can create a new set from an array or any iterable using the set constructor which is what we have done here we took the array and created a set out of it by doing that right there so again joke answer but nevertheless uh, one of my favorite ones to always throw out. Uh, in these videos to make sure that uh, y'all 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 have some jokes in your tool belt to throw out as well because it's part of the fun right if it's not fun then what's the point uh, and finally you know thank thank you guys for watching hope you found this video helpful in your journey to become a better developer where that's even myself, like I'm making this free online course because I have experience under my belt, uh, both coding and teaching. So I want to make us all, myself included, better developers, which is why if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to our channel for more videos like this. Uh, also, I would love to hear your thoughts on the algorithm or data structures we covered in this particular video here. Well, not data structure. Yeah, well, I me, mean, I've covered data structures, set and map. Those are data structures. If you have any suggestions for alternate or more efficient solutions, please share them in the comments below. You have already started doing that in previous videos. I need to revisit some of those. And like I said, pin the comments light to the top. Remember, constructive and positive comments are always welcome here. Let's keep the discussion going and help each other improve our coding skills. Thanks again for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next video.